If you have a copy of God's Word with you, go ahead and grab it and open up to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17. So Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 12. We're continuing our series in the book of Matthew. We're talking about kingdom living. You find the theme in the book of Matthew over and over again about the king. And, and the king has come and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and what does it look like to live in the kingdom? And today what we are going to be looking at is the beginning of the king's ministry. Jesus, how he begins to minister to the world that he came to save. And we're going to see that it is a ministry of light and life. So Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 12, this is what it says. Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we open your word together and consider what we have just read, Lord, I pray that you would guide my speech and allow it to be edifying. Let it build up your people. Lord, I pray that you would use the proclamation of your gospel and your word to call to life those who are lost in their sin. And Lord, that you would use the proclamation of the gospel and your word to continue to transform those of us who have faith in your son, that we would continue to grow, continue to become more like you, Jesus, as we seek to continue your ministry to this dark world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So as I was preparing this message, I, I just kept thinking through the ideas of darkness and light. And one of the things that I was just thinking about over and over again is our, is our culture. And many conversations I end up having are about the culture and What's wrong with it, right? And, you know, I started thinking about, man, are Christians just always upset about what's wrong with the world? And I was like, to some degree, yeah, we are, we can be like that. But as I thought about it, I started thinking, like, who isn't? You know, who isn't talking about what's wrong? You know, I, I was thinking through it, and you, you think about it yourself, I, I, I think people, whether you are a Christian or not, I think people are just naturally inclined to find out what's bad and then complain about it, aren't we? And I think that if we aren't careful, we will fall into that exact same pattern of just focusing on what's bad, what's wrong, and then just complaining about it. And here's the problem with that doesn't do any good. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't make anything better. It only makes us feel worse and, and be frustrated. So does that mean that we just ignore the darkness of our world? Well, that's one response. You could respond that way and just pretend that it doesn't exist. You could. You could. You could just get angry. You could be mad all the time because the world doesn't live according to God's 
mandates. We could be frustrated all of the time, or we could seek to do what Jesus did. And I think that is probably our best bet, is to do what Jesus did. And that's really the first question I'm asking us this morning, is how should we respond to the foolishness and the sinfulness of the world that we all used to partake of and sometimes still do? How should we respond to the sinfulness and the foolishness of our dark world? Well, like I said, you can be angry, you can be frustrated, or you can just ignore it altogether. And and Christians, let's be real. A lot of people in the world think that we're just mad at them. Would Would you agree that that's how people feel? A lot of people in the world think we are just mad at them. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians are just mad at them. But here's the problem. We used to be them. Like we were them and we know what it means to be in darkness. And it is hypocritical to just be mad at them because they're lost. Now, that doesn't mean that we are loosey-goosey about sin. It doesn't mean that we don't hold people accountable. It doesn't mean any of those things. What it means is we look at the log in our own eye before we start pointing out the speck in others, right? Well, how do we do this? Like, why do we proclaim the gospel? What is the motivation that I should have every Sunday morning when I stand in front of you to proclaim the word of God? What's the motivation you should have as students? You're going to school and you're hanging out with your friends and you're spending time with them all the time, interacting with them on social media, whatever you're doing. People in in the world, as you go to work or you interact with your lost family members, what should be your motivation to talk to them about Jesus? Is it because you're mad at them about the way that they live? That is not what it means to be a Christian. No, we don't proclaim Jesus because we're mad at the world. Rather, we are dedicated to proclaiming Christ to the world. Why? Because he is the only source of light and life. That's why we do it. And we have to check our own motivations sometimes because we all fall into this where we get frustrated about, we have righteous anger about sin. But it's not our place to be the judge of the world. It's us to tell people about the judge of the world. And so you see Jesus coming into his ministry. And he really, it's interesting. He says the exact same words that John the Baptist said, right? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But Matthew does this thing where he points out some really interesting prophecy fulfillment that we have got to focus on this morning. And so we're going to see how Jesus really emulates. He, he examples this to us, how he is the light and life of the world. And he's going to show us how we need to minister, how we need to serve those who are lost. So here's the first thing that you see that we need to recognize is that sin brings darkness and death. So look at verses 12 through 16. I mean, this whole thing that's going on here. It says, Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody and he withdrew to Galilee. What that means is he basically found out that John was being persecuted for the message that he was proclaiming, which is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was also like repent of what? Of specific sins. John the Baptist was calling out the king, Herod at the time, Because Herod was having an affair and he was with his brother's wife. Listen, we get all bent out of shape because we live in 2024 and politics is, you know, hard, right? This is hard politics. John the Baptist is saying, hey, you're sinning, Herod, the king. And Herod's like, hey, John, I'm going to arrest you. Okay, the world is dark, isn't it? It's been dark for 2,000 years, it's been dark ever since Adam and Eve fell into sin. This is normal. 
even though it's unfortunate. Jesus goes into Galilee. He passes by Nazareth, and it says that this was to fulfill what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. And then he quotes from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, which is really interesting. We'll talk about that in a second. And he says it's the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. It's beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And then he says that a great light will shine on those sitting in the darkness. The, the light will dawn on those who are in the shadow of death. And so as we consider this, we find that sin is what brings this darkness and death. Because what happens with sin is sin makes us spiritually blind and it causes suffering in life. Sin is never followed by a long amount of joy. Sin is always followed by, usually what happens is you sin, you have immediate gratification, and then suffering. That's what happens when you sin. You sin, you get immediate gratification, and then it's gone and you suffer for it. Because you're living outside of God's plans. We know that that's what's going on here because Galilee is called a region of darkness because they were full of spiritual blindness and societal suffering. We have to do some history here. We have to go back and see what this prophecy is all about and what happened to Galilee. Why is it called this area of darkness and the shadow of death? Well, the reason why is because of their history. If you go back to 2 Kings chapter 16, you read about how the northern kingdom of Israel, they are not happy with the southern kingdom of Jerusalem, of Judah. And the northern kingdom of Israel starts attacking Jerusalem, and they're trying to take over the holy city. The people of God, they're fighting against each other. Why is this all happening? Because the northern kingdom of Israel had been led by kings who put them into sin and more sin and more sin. Idolatry after idolatry after idolatry. There was not a single good king in Israel from the time of Solomon to the time of what happened in 2 Kings 16. God sends... Tiglath Pileser, the king of Assyria, to come down and absolutely annihilate the northern region of the kingdom of Israel. He takes over starting in Galilee and all these other places that it mentions that I won't bore you with. But what you see here is political destruction, suffering that none of us know, not that I'm aware of. And this lasted for 700 years before the time of Christ. Galilee was in political turmoil, under control of the Gentiles, not being able to live on their own rule for over 700 years. And even beyond that, they just kept getting conquered by somebody new. Why did that happen? Why? Because they failed to observe their covenant with God. They rejected God. And what happens when you sin against God? Darkness and suffering follows, leading all the way to death. This is what happens to us, isn't it? This is how life is for us even today. It was that way 2,700 years ago. It was that way 2,000 years ago. It was that way 1500, it's that way today. As individuals, spiritual darkness is a result of our sin nature and the indulgence of that sin nature. And we are surrounded by darkness. I know that I don't really have to convince you of that, but we have to understand how serious it is before we get to the, the good stuff, okay? Okay. But to drive the, the point home one more time, I want to read for you what Charles Spurgeon said as he was preaching on this very same point. Remember, this was about two, yeah, this was about 200 years ago. Charles Spurgeon is preaching on this exact same passage. Listen to what he says as he preached to his congregation on that Sunday morning in 1871. Many at this time and in this city 
are truly living in the domain of spiritual death. All around them is death. If they have stepped into this house this morning, their position is an exception to their general one. They will go home to a Sabbath-breaking household. They will hear habitually oaths, profane language, lascivious songs, and thus they breathe in the reek of the charnel house. If they have a good thought, it's ridiculed by those around them. They dwell as among the tombs with men whose mouths are open sepulchers, pouring forth all manner of offensiveness. How sad a condition. It seems to such poor souls, perhaps being now a little awakened, that everything about them is prophetic of death. They're afraid to take a step, lest the earth should open the door to the bottomless pit. You know what that sounds like to me? Sounds like the epidemic, the wave of anxiety that's just overwhelming our culture. Sounds like the wave of mental health crisis that's overwhelming our culture. It sounds to me like everything that we are experiencing in 2024. People, sin brings darkness and death because darkness and suffering come from three places. It comes from our individual sin. But you know this, it can come from other people sinning against you. Other people can sin against you and bring a lot of suffering into your life. But the effects of sin on the whole world in general, it's all around us. In a sin-filled, fallen world, we are surrounded by darkness. But now I'm done with that. Now I'm done talking about that. You got the point. I know you know it. And, and here's the one thing I want to just drop a pin in. Christians, let's stop complaining about how bad the world is. And I'm talking to me first. Let's start looking at what the solution is. We already know the world is bad. It's as bad as it's ever been. And yeah, is it going to get worse? Probably. Let's not worry about that. Let's focus on what Jesus did and what we're supposed to do as well. Because that's not the end of the story, that we live in a dark, fallen world is nothing new. But what is new, what was new on this day when Jesus the King started his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit, he goes into the land of darkness. What was new is that Jesus brings the light and the life. You look at verse 16. And it's quoting from Isaiah chapter 9. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land and the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. Do you know what else is in uh, Isaiah chapter 9? If you remember, uh, maybe a few months ago, we were talking about prophecy. Anytime they're quoting from Old Testament prophecy, they're expecting the audience or their reader to be thinking about What else is in that chapter or in that context? In Isaiah chapter 9, what do we hear about? Oh, we hear about the one who would come, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the prince of peace, the everlasting father. And so what you get here is Matthew showing that Jesus showed up, bringing the light into this dark region as the Messiah. And he is building this huge argument for the fact that Jesus is the hope of the world. He is the one who brings peace to our darkness. But why is he described as light? Why light? As I started getting into this, light is used a lot in the Bible. Darkness and light in the New Testament, it's all over the place. You start studying this theme of light, and it's everywhere. As we think about light, we immediately recognize that light brings to us life. You think about the sun. If we didn't have the sun, we could not have life on the planet Earth. But it also brings to us sight. You cannot see without light. 
Light is what makes you able to see what's around you, able to know what is going on around you. And so we get the metaphor that if Jesus is light, what that means is that he is the source of all life and the source of all wisdom, all spiritual sight. And the Bible just is all about this. It's everywhere. It's, it's really surprising as you get into it. You see it all over the place. You see, Jesus is the place that we get true understanding, true wisdom, and, and even life itself. That's where when um, David Jones was reading our passage this morning, that last verse in Psalm 36, what did it say? It said, with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. It's the light of God, the light of Christ shining on us that makes us able to see reality at all. This is why the world is so blind. They, they don't have light. They are in the darkness and they cannot understand. This is why they feel like their lives are so meaningless and so pointless. Even when they achieve everything the world has told them, they feel so empty because they do not have the light of Christ that brings them life. John 8, 12, Jesus says this. He says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, see that? The, the Bible, it's amazing. It constantly puts these themes together. Light and life go together Knowing God and having life go together. That's what it means to have spiritual sight. And Jesus is life itself. He is the one who created all things, and without him nothing was made that has been made. And if he doesn't shine the light of salvation on us, what does the Bible teach? That we are blind and dead in our sins. We are the darkness because of sin. But because of his light that he brought into the world, he brought into this place, the, the least likely of places, Galilee. It doesn't make any sense from a worldly perspective. Galilee's nowhere special. But he invades the darkness so that we can see truth and have eternal life. Christian, I honestly am struggling to make this land, and here's why. Because we're so used to hearing these things. We are so used to hearing about Jesus is the light of the world, I am the light of the world, go and shine the light of the gospel, blah, blah, blah. I get it. Okay, Pastor Brian, can we go have lunch now? No, you can't. <laughs> so here's the thing. One of the things that, that I, I'm, I am trying to do every time I preach is not to just tell you things. I'm trying to help you apply this truth to your life, okay? Because knowing stuff doesn't really matter. Satan knows more things than you and I do all put together, okay? So I'm not just here trying to make you smart, although I do hope you learn. I'm trying to help all of us, myself included, be able to live this out. But here's the thing. There's a trick to it. I can't make that happen, and neither can you. And I'll get to that. That's our third point. We'll get to that in just a second. But here's, here's where I want to hopefully apply this to your life. Listen to what C.S. Lewis says. This is great. When we're talking about light and we're surrounded by darkness, C.S. Lewis, he says this. He says, our light can swallow up your darkness, but your darkness cannot now infect our light. I don't know about you, but I need to remember this truth that is only found in Jesus Christ. I can be absolutely immersed in the darkness of the world. And don't we all get there sometimes? Even in your own mind, you're going through suffering that's unbelievable. You're fighting against sin that's unbelievable. But you have Jesus, and you don't even know how you're going to be able to hold on. 
but you know that he's going to hold on to you. And he's going to carry you through. Why? Because he is the light. And when you have him, the darkness cannot, it, it cannot push in the light. You turn off all the lights in this room. You black out those windows there. And I strike one match. And we will see the light everywhere. Jesus is a little bit more than a match. He is light itself. He is the life. And it cannot be taken away from us, Christian. Nor can it be stopped. You see, Herod was trying to kill John the Baptist. And what he didn't know is he was just entering into phase two of everything John the Baptist was doing. He got John out of the way. John the Baptist even said this to Jesus' disciples and his own disciples. He said, I must decrease and he must increase. And how did it happen? Herod, trying to squash the light of the kingdom of God, takes John the Baptist out of the picture for the Messiah to step in and start shining light into the world. You cannot stop the light of God. And if you have the light of God, you, you really can go through the absolute darkest things. I haven't been through the darkest things. But I know people who have. And I am constantly looking at them and what they're telling me is, <laughs> Jesus, it was just Jesus every step of the way. I just needed him. And he got me through it. So you might be surrounded by darkness, but your light is not in danger because Jesus is your light if you have faith in him. But back to that point that I said where I can't actually make this happen in your life, right? I can't actually make you do any of these things. It's really frustrating for me, okay? Um, I cannot make any of us. I, I struggle to make myself live out these things, right? But look at this last Verse, verse 17, what does Jesus do? What does he start saying? It's revolutionary. It's amazing. It's, it's completely different. Not really. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What I want us to see here in these last few moments is that spiritual sight, this is point number three, spiritual sight brings to us repentance and hope. And I have to show you some other places in Scripture to help you see what's going on here. Spiritual sight brings repentance and hope. Jesus comes proclaiming the same message that's been proclaimed by the prophets. Turn back to God. He proclaims the same message that's proclaimed by John the Baptist. Turn back to God. He's proclaiming the same message that I am proclaiming to you this morning. Turn to God. But what's different? The light is here. The light is here. Spiritual sight is given to people so that they can turn and believe. You see, we need God to shine the light of Jesus into our lives so that we can see Christ, turn to Christ, and believe in Christ. The Bible says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. The Bible says that we are blinded by the darkness of our hearts. Dead men don't just get up and walk. Blind people don't just all of a sudden start seeing. Blind persons don't just think to themselves one day, I would like to see today. Okay, I'm going to start seeing now. It doesn't happen. Something has to happen to them. What is that? What is it that happens to us in our spiritual death, in our spiritual darkness, that brings us to the place where we want Jesus, where we want to turn, where we say, He is my hope. He is my salvation it's the spiritual sight that comes from the light of Christ shown in your heart. The way that this works, 
The Holy Spirit uses the preaching of the gospel. What I'm doing right now, why do I preach the gospel every Sunday and tell it to people every time I talk to them if I am not actually able to make them believe? Because I believe this. I believe that the Holy Spirit uses every time that I proclaim the gospel to call to to call people to repent and he shines the light of Christ into their hearts in order to bring them to repentance. The Holy Spirit is using the proclamation, even what Jesus says here, to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, to call people to see with their spiritual eyes. And the reason why I say this is because of first, or I'm sorry, second Corinthians chapter four, verse six. Listen to this. Second Corinthians four, six. Remember I said that light is everywhere in the New Testament. You see it all over the place. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says, God, who said, light shall shine out of the darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Did you hear that? What the Bible is teaching you and I is that Jesus came and you heard the gospel and somebody, somebody told you the gospel, proclaimed God's word to you. And what happened? The Holy Spirit moved on you, didn't he? The Holy Spirit helped you to, to see something that you didn't see before. You, you recognized something that you didn't recognize before. And all of a sudden, Jesus became real to you. And you, and you thought, I need Jesus and you realize that he was glorious, and you realize that you were a sinner, and all of a sudden you said, Jesus, save me. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. I know that that's true because of 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. Listen to what Paul says there. He says, Therefore I make to known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says that Jesus is accursed, and no one, this is the important part, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has opened your eyes and made you able to see. He's given you spiritual sight and rescued you from your darkness because of Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. And so you were able to turn. You turned to Jesus. You received your forgiveness from sins because the kingdom of heaven is here and you want to be all about that. You love the kingdom because now you love God because the love of God has been poured into your heart by the Holy Spirit, causing us to cry out, what? Abba, Father. And so that's why, church, only proclaiming the gospel and trusting that the Holy Spirit will truly shine light and give sight to the blind will work. That's, that's why we proclaim the gospel. And that's why we don't have to be angry at everybody in the world. That's why I don't have to be mad when craziness is happening around. I struggle with that temptation. I'm not going to lie to you. I do. There is righteous anger, and that's good and well, but, but then what do I do about it? I trust the Holy Spirit. I trust God. And I know that if I want to make a difference in your life, I give to you Jesus, and I call you to turn to him. And I can't make you do that. And so what do I do every Sunday? This is hard. This is really hard, especially for somebody who likes things to be a certain way, okay? I have to trust God to work in your life the way he sees fit to work in your life because he's God and I'm not. <laughs> Go figure. It's the same thing with my children. Every day I'm reading them the Bible. Every day I'm praying with them. Every day I'm teaching them, I'm proclaiming to them, repent and believe because Jesus is the king. And I'm just asking God to do what only he can do, to make them see and to bring them from death into life. Unbeliever, maybe you're here today and you know you're in the darkness you know you have not seen Christ yet. You've heard about him. You've been to church or something, but you've not really been 
given spiritual sight. Listen, unbeliever, we are not condemning you. We're not condemning you because we used to be you. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. And all of us need forgiveness from our sins. And so, unbeliever, if you're here this, uh, this morning, listen, I know that there are unbelievers in this place. Okay, you understand that? Maybe watching online, I don't know. I'm, I'm talking to you. We just want you to see Jesus and turn to him for your salvation. We want you to be free from your darkness. That's it. We're not like mad at you. We hate sin because we love God and we want you to love God too and be freed from your darkness. So do you see his grace as we've been talking about Jesus this morning? Are you seeing his forgiveness? Do you want to be transformed and be made new? Or do you want to sit in your darkness some more? Believer, are you walking in the light of Christ? Are you walking with Jesus? You've been given the light, you have spiritual sight, but are you paying attention? Is the gospel what motivates and drives everything you do? And I literally mean everything you do. Does the gospel drive everything you do? I know I got room to grow there. Do you have room to grow there? We all do. And guess what? If we continue following Jesus, we will grow there. We will grow. And we will become even more gospel-centered to the place where people can't know us without knowing that we are Christians. Here's the biggest indictment on our lives as Christians. If people in your workplace or at your school don't know that you're a Christian, if they don't know that you're a Christian, then you need to ask yourself, is the gospel really motivating my life? Because here's the thing. We could be angry at the world if we wanted to, or we can proclaim the good news of Jesus to sinners who we used to be and still are so that they can receive sight and be changed by Jesus, so that they can be saved. That's how we are going to join Jesus in his ministry of light and life is to proclaim Jesus and then trust the Holy Spirit to do things that we can't do. So right now, we're going to take a couple of minutes doing that very thing where we are proclaiming to one another the gospel of Jesus Christ through the partaking of the Lord's Supper, where we are going to say that Jesus died on the cross, his body broken for me, his blood shed for me. And so deacons, if you would, go ahead and make your way down here, deacons. We're going to prepare ourselves, and you prepare yourself. As you think through proclaiming the gospel to this church, to those who are watching online, they know that's what we're about to do. And as you leave this place, you're preparing yourself to proclaim the gospel in everything you do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare ourselves.